Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful fall day. We are inside in a windowless conference room, but hopefully you'll get to enjoy it. You already did and get to enjoy it a little bit later. My name is Wendell Pritchett. I have the great honor of serving as the new provost of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and among the things that I have really enjoyed is getting to know all, or at least some, of the amazing work that we're doing in the fields of health. Um, so it's a real pleasure for me to spend a few minutes with you uh, th this afternoon um, and to help us get started. So um, as provost, it's, great, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second, this is our second of, of many, Penn, uh, annual Penn Integrates Knowledge uh, Roundtable Discussions organized by our PIK professors, uh, which we call PICS. Um, and so I'm going to refer to a few, use that word a few times. So it really is appropriate that we're talking about our PIC professors because they pick the topic, <laughs> they pick the venue, uh, they even picked me to kick it off. Um, so they did lots of picking and I feel like the first guy in the draft. I'm happy to be here. Um, but they, they chose me uh, to give opening remarks and I intend to be brief because you really want to hear them, not me. So as you may know, the PIC program was created in 2005 to recruit renowned professors to Penn who are appointed in two or more schools. This is a way to, to uh, break down silos and really accelerate the great research that we're doing at Penn. So distinguished by the diversity of their research and teaching, each PIC professor has a unique area of focus. But what they share is a deep desire to solve complex problems, real world problems by working across fields. This approach is vital to modern teaching, research, and scholarship, and it's vital to the Penn education. It's vital to our success at Penn. So each PIC professor with us today will touch on one, or knowing them many, several, aspects of the health disparities that continue stubbornly to plague not just our own country, but global health. Health disparities are preventable, for preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, and longevity. You all know that. And more than that, in the opportunity for everyone, including minority and other disadvantaged groups, to achieve optimal health. I think you'll agree this is a very timely topic. Unfortunately, it's becoming even more timely. So in order of their presentations, and we're going to bring them up right now, Karen Glanz, the George A. Weiss University professor who studies epidemiology and nursing. Sarah Tishkoff, the David and Lynn Silfen University professor who studies genetics and biology. And my colleague, Dorothy Roberts, the George A. Weiss University professor who studies law and sociology. So each are going to present for 15 minutes. And following uh, Professor Roberts, uh, there will be time for a discussion and Q&A. And I think we're, everybody's going to come up at the same time. And then, Karen, you're going to say a couple introductory remarks. And then we're going to get started. Is that the plan? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So again, thank you all for being here. It's really important work that we're doing. And this is going to be a great discussion that I know will generate lots of other uh, fruitful interactions. So thank you. And please join us. Thank you, and thank you for, uh, for coming. We're actually not all going to come up until we're done with our talks. Um, and thank you, Provost Pritchett, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I do want to mention, for those of you who saw our earlier publicity, that unfortunately Zeke Emanuel was unable to be here today. He's uh, called away for an emergency. Um, but uh, we know that we'll be able to have a, a vibrant and interesting discussion when we get done with our three talks. So um, we ask you to hold any questions and comments that you have until all three talks are done. I think that'll be a time when uh, you'll be sufficiently provoked by our provocative uh, talks to, uh, to bring in your perspectives and ideas and, and thoughts on this issue. So um, during my brief talk today, I'm going to speak from the perspective of social sciences and epidemiology. Um, the disciplines um, and multi-disciplines from which I come, and also from a U.S. perspective primarily. Uh, Sarah Tishkoff uh, especially will be focusing on a lot of international and global issues. I'm going to briefly give a definition and scope of health disparities, um, talk about health disparities uh, across race and ethnic groups, um, the notion of social determinants, a little bit about what we know about interventions that work to reduce health disparities, and conclude with a few comments about science policy and funding and how they all uh, tie into the health disparities issue. So, so first, a, a little bit of definition. Often the term health equity is used, or health inequities, 
um, instead of disparities. And, and people like that. It sounds a little more balanced, but uh, we often think of them as, um, as the same meaning. So health disparities are the disproportionate disease, disease burden or burden of health behaviors across subpopulations. And most people think about this primarily in terms of differences across racial and ethnic groups um, or across groups of varying socioeconomic status. So that's a lot of where our conversation will go just based on a time limitation. But there are also a lot of other health disparities to think about. Some may be interests of, of yours uh, across gender groups, groups of varying levels of education, sexual orientation, geography, urban, rural, and so on. Uh, health disparities go beyond just the burden of disease or the differences in behaviors to include access to and quality of health care services, an increasingly important uh, focus. And one of the underlying assumptions is that inequality disparities are unfair, unjust, or avoidable, and that that's what we should be working to change. So I'm going to give you just some brief examples of key racial and ethnic disparities in health. For those of you that like your statistics, you won't really need any statistical test to see how big these differences are. They are ginormous, <laughs> simply put. Um, this graph is uh, differences in infant mortality in the United States by racial and ethnic groups. And you can see that the rates are by far the highest for African Americans, followed by American Indians, Hispanics, and then Asians and, and whites. Um, the difference in motor vehicle accidents, actually the highest rates in motor vehicle accidents occur for American Indians that are at about twice the rate um, that they are for whites. Um, heart disease is uh, much higher among African Americans than it is among whites. Um, and homicide, a staggering almost tenfold um, higher rate among African Americans than among whites. And last, HIV infection also, uh, for those of you not working in this area, may be surprised to learn that in the US, there's about a nine-fold uh, rate of HIV infection among African Americans compared to whites. So those are just some examples. In the cancer area, um, this is a really good place where we can see uh, the differences between getting a disease, between the incidence of the disease, and death from the disease. So, the, the differences there often reflect something about the health care that people are getting, but also perhaps about the aggressiveness of the disease. So for men, African American men have by far the highest rates of um, being diagnosed with cancer, but also of dying from cancer. Um, among women, African Americans have the highest rates of being diagnosed, but it's actually white women who have the highest rates of dying from cancer. And um, you can see those rates differ quite a bit with very high rates for Hispanics as well. Uh, there are other diseases where the racial and ethnic groups that have the excess burden um, are different from, from what you might be thinking of, and one in particular is tuberculosis. We've done a lot to reduce the rates of tuberculosis, as you can see by the, the decrease um, on this graph. But it's actually Asian and Pacific Islanders who have by far the highest rates of tuberculosis. And even though their rates are declining, as the rates of other ethnic groups are, there's still an enormous gap. So the question is, why? Why do these differences exist? What can we do about it? And there are a lot of different models and perspectives. This particularly lends itself to this multidisciplinary way of looking at things. There are genetic, genomic models. You'll hear from Sarah Tishkoff a great deal about that. Um, issues related to racism, sexism, discrimination that I know Dorothy Roberts will be addressing. Um, social environmental models and models related to access to health care um, that I'm going to talk more specifically about. And there are interaction models um, that are the combinations of a lot of these factors. So let's take a look at the question of social class and health disparities. Um, social class differences in morbidity and mortality are largely due to differences in the material conditions in people's lives, the places that people live, work, um, play, uh, and differences in their access to resources, both private resources and public resources. Um, the day-to-day -day education, work, healthcare, 
recreation, and so on. Uh, there's an interesting theory called the broken windows theory. This is actually a theory that emerged out of uh, the field of criminology, which is a specialty, kind of some people would say an offshoot of sociology. Um, and it was introduced about 35 years ago by Wilson and Kelling. And it was the theory that when you kind of drive down the street and you see broken windows, they indicate neighborhood disorder. And it's been found over and over again that higher rates of crime are associated with broken windows. And this theory has been adopted by um, some people in the health field. A really interesting study by Deborah Cohn and others in New Orleans found that rates of gonorrhea in micro neighborhoods in New Orleans were associated with the prevalence of this broken windows index. And more recently, Howard Frumpkin has suggested that the looking at health and the built environment, um, broken windows is a good analogy and a place to start showing us that, that neighborhoods can be conducive to or um, not conducive to health improvement. So when we talk about social determinants, we're talking about the conditions that people live in that are not necessarily medical or health or biology. Um, and education is a, is a prime one. Um, and some people might not like that this um, graph, I know my math colleagues don't like that this graph starts at 40, but the bottom line here is that college graduates can expect to live at least five years longer than individuals who haven't graduated from high school. So that's good news for all of us, I think, in this room. Um, and that this gradient of longevity and education uh, exists for men and women, although women tend to live a little bit longer. And th this is not how long you expect to live, not to 54 and 48. That's after the age of 25. <laughs> so just in case anybody's like thinking that that, that doesn't sound old enough. So health behaviors often track along with educational level as well, and there are higher rates of smoking among people with lower education. Um, only 9% of college, grad, college graduates smoke in the current environment, and about 29% of those with only a high school education or less. And that difference has widened over time. So something going on there, some association with education, not necessarily causal, but definitely a correlate. Um, we also see that smoking rates are highest in low-income neighborhoods. So I'm going to show you some um, Philadelphia maps, thanks to the health department putting these all together. They come from local surveys of our region and from the American Community Survey done by the census. And this shows adult smoking prevalence on the left with the highest rates in red, and this shows the percentage of people living in poverty in these neighborhoods, and don't they look similar? Something going on. So why might that be? Interesting, um, the next map shows the uh, density of tobacco retailers um, in neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And doesn't that look similar too? Um, that the highest rates of tobacco retailers align with the highest rates of smoking and the highest rates of poverty. I, I won't comment further on that, but we can talk more about it later. Um, when we look at obesity, we actually see uh, a pattern that has a lot of similarities. Um, this uh, first graph is uh, from studies and surveys done in New York showing that there's a fourfold uh, rate of obesity among adults living in East Harlem compared to those living on the Upper East Side. So it's not geographic. Something else must be going on. And in Philadelphia, we have childhood obesity and adult obesity distributions in the city. And we have those juxtaposed with education, with red being the lowest education. So again, we see social determinants uh, really in our face. Um, so what's going on? Here's one thing that happens to be going on that we found in our research that there are, uh, is less availability of fruits and vegetables in lower income neighborhoods than in higher income neighborhoods. That could be something contributing. And just to circle back and remind you, we have higher rates of poverty among blacks, American Indians, and Hispanics um, by far than among white uh, majority populations. We also have disparities in healthcare access. Um, basically, you see here that the risk of being uninsured is much lower for whites than it is for non-whites, and the risk of having a difficulty communicating with your healthcare provider is also higher for non-whites than it is for whites. And that, that also can include 
um, language differences um, embedded within that. Um, an interesting study that Karen Rhodes and others published a few years back looked at primary care access, and this was before the Affordable Care Act. They phoned about 13,000, uh, made about 13,000 phone calls across 10 states asking to make an appointment with a primary care provider. And what they found was that 84% of privately insured people who said they were privately insured on the phone were able to get an appointment, but only 58% of those on Medicaid. So it's not just the insurance, it might be the type of insurance that one has also. Um, and maybe a little discrimination going on there. So what can we do to reduce health disparities? What are some ways to think about that? I want to suggest that some of the most important ways to reduce health disparities are by going upstream. What do we mean by going upstream? Well, if you can think of this raging river, and you can think of somebody playing alongside of it, they might be falling in the river upstream. We can fish them out downstream, and they will survive. But wouldn't it be better if we could prevent them from falling in to the stream in the first place? So upstream health improvement strategies address health problems by addressing these social determinants and the environment and the policies that shape our health and our health behavior. Uh, they have the greatest potential to improve health among disadvantaged groups and potentially can provide the greatest benefit overall to the most people. So what are some of those strategies? This, this model that's been uh, adopted over the last couple decades very strongly starts with dealing with individuals and goes all the way up to the social and economic policies, neighborhoods, and communities. And so we, we need all those. It's not to say we don't need to help individuals or, or work with individuals to improve the situation, but we really need to work at all these levels. And this um, health impact pyramid that was put forward by Tom Frieden, the previous director of the Centers for Disease Control, pretty much nails the idea that um, you can put a lot of effort into things like counseling and clinical interventions, but you can make more of a population impact by working toward the bottom of this, this uh, pyramid, changing the context, changing socioeconomic factors. Um, when I first heard some of these ideas earlier in my career, one of the first things that struck me is, but I'm trained in health. And you can, can think doctors can say this. I wasn't trained to change socioeconomic factors. So we really need to think creatively about how we can all be involved in trying to solve these problems. A couple of the strategies to reduce health disparities that are promising are quite simply reducing resource inequality and disparities in education and income. Things that are very timely in our current political climate and uh, we've made some progress and um, lots more to come. Addressing the environments and contexts, such as built environment improvements, uh, ensuring that interventions have adequate reach, such as the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion, very much on the political agenda right now, uh, medical homes. And we can also, as scientists, make sure that we pay attention to these issues and um, make extra efforts to include disadvantaged groups in our studies, um, and that our research also has that secondary impact of improving health outcomes. Um, some interesting work that's been done in Philadelphia by Charlie Branis and colleagues um, takes aim at uh, the built environment and housing very specifically, abandoned building remediation. Um, they worked with a Philadelphia housing authority that um, enacted a Philadelphia doors and windows ordinance in 2011. Um, and did a comparison study where they renovated vacant and abandoned buildings and compared them to non-remediated buildings. And you could see some of the before and after there. And they actually found reduction in violent crime, gun assaults, and nuisance crimes. So their particular focus on the injury and violence side of the health equation, but there are other health impacts as well. And they're currently doing a larger trial of uh, vacant lot remediation. So what works? So these are a couple, these are examples, these are ideas. Uh, the Community Guide to Preventive Services, which I served on for 10 years, looks at the literature overall. What does the research tell us? It tells us that education programs and policies do help to promote health equity, early childhood education, full day kindergarten, high school completion programs, and school-based health centers. 
Housing programs, tenant-based rental assistance programs have been found to impact health equity, and that there is insufficient evidence for some of these strategies of trying to improve culturally competent health care, bilingual services, diverse health care workforce. That doesn't mean that these aren't effective. It just means that there aren't enough studies yet that have shown that they're effective, or maybe we need to look for improved ways to, to make them work. Last, I want to just say a few things about science policy and funding and some uh, developments over the last two decades that affect those of us who do research with human subjects, um, and particularly those of us that get government funding. Um, in 1997, the Office of Management and Budget, an important health institution, not, uh, <laughs> revised the standards for collecting and reporting on race and ethnicity. And in 2001, the National Institutes of Health adopted these standards and required everyone involved with any funding, intramural or extramural, um, to follow them. And in 2000, the National Institute for uh, Minority Health and Health Disparities was first created and given full institute status in 2010. Um, what did that lead to? It led to this required race and ethnicity reporting that we all have to adhere to. We can come back and talk about this later because you'll see that it, it puts the big bubble around um, Hispanic and non-Hispanic and underneath that um, different racial identifications. The ideal strategies for improving health equity are um, not just to reduce the difference between the disadvantage and the advantage, but to, if you will, uh, take the, the idea of a rising tide lifting all boats to create social and physical environments that promote good health for all and um, achieve, uh, eliminate disparities for the health of all groups. A lot of unanswered questions remain. We don't know what combinations of strategies work best. We don't know how long it takes for meaningful change, but we see that it probably takes longer than one grant funding cycle. Um, and um, the question that my colleagues, Sarah and Dorothy, will be addressing, where do genetic, biological, historical, and legal <coughs> issues um, fit into this equation? Thank you. So, let's see. So I, I want to start by saying how pleased I am to be here today with my colleagues, uh, Karen and Dorothy. You're going to hear some pretty different perspectives, but I think hopefully very complementary. And what I'm going to tell you about today is the genomic perspective of studies to help alleviate uh, health disparities. So something that I was taught when I was a human genetics uh, PhD student at Yale was that one of the characteristics of diseases that have a genetic basis is that they differ in prevalence in ethnic groups. So these are some example of Mendelian diseases, and that means that they are caused by um, single gene disorders that differ in prevalence amongst ethnic groups. So for example, cystic fibrosis is very common in uh, European Americans, Tay-Sachs disease in Ashkenazi Jews, phenylketonuria in African Americans. But what about complex diseases? And complex diseases refers to diseases that are caused by multiple genes together with environment. So an example is hypertension. You can see from this statistic that um, hypertension is more prevalent in people of African descent in the US. If we look at the prevalence of diabetes, which is another complex uh, disorder, we can see that it's most prevalent in Hispanic populations and also in African Americans, Asian Americans, relative to people of European descent. So I do research in Africa, and that's a, reg a region where we don't see quite as much diabetes in more rural areas, but we're seeing it rapidly on the rise in urban areas, and it's estimated that by the year 2030, there's going to be 24 million people impacted by diabetes in Africa. Now that's telling us that obviously there are environmental factors that are playing a role, but that doesn't mean that there aren't also underlying genetic factors that together with environment is influencing disease risk. So for you to understand why do we see these differences in genetic uh, variants that play a role in disease risk, I have to tell you start with human origins. 
And here I'm showing you these red dots represent the location of anatomically modern humans that originated in Africa. The oldest recently has been dated to about 300,000 years ago. After this origin in Africa, sometime between 50 to 80,000 years ago, there was a migration of relatively small numbers of people, could have been in the hundreds to thousands, out of Africa, giving rise to all other populations. When this occurred, we call this a bottleneck, because there's like a population crash when people migrated out of Africa, you get a reduction in the genetic diversity, and you can get dramatic shifts in the frequency of genetic variants. This is also pronounced when you have more recent migrations, for example, into the Pacific Islands within the past 3,000 or so years. So how much do we differ? Well, in theory, identical twins, there should be no differences in genomes. If we compared any of our genomes here in this room, we differ at about one out of 1,000 nucleotides. If we compare human to chimp, one out of 100, to mouse, one out of 30, and to broccoli, two out of three. Now, considering that there are three billion DNA bases, that means three million nucleotide variants between any pair of genomes. However, this is my funny slide of um, ethnic diversity amongst beautiful people, according to Estee Lauder. <laughs> but even amongst the rest of us, <laughs> there's not that much variation as a whole. We're talking about, you know, very recent common ancestry. <clears throat> However, <laughs> that's not to say that there are no differences. So, this is from a recent review paper um, that was published, I think actually just last week. And it's uh, representing data from the Thousand Genomes Project. This was an NIH initiative to do whole genome sequencing, and they ended up doing actually about 2,000 individuals from globally diverse populations. In gray, they're showing the variants that are shared either in a region or globally, and you could see that that's the majority of genetic variation. And then in colors are those that are private either to a continent or to a population. And you can see that they certainly do exist, simply reflecting our evolutionary history. This was another paper that recently came out that was really shocking to me when I saw this. They did um, looked at the number of genome-wide association studies that have been done in ethnically diverse populations. So those are studies where we look at uh, genetic variants around the genome, across the genome, and we look for an association with the disease. If you see a strong association, that implies that that genetic marker is physically linked or pretty close to that disease-causing variant or gene. So these studies in, um, I think this was 2009, 96% were in people of European descent. In 2016, it's gotten a bit better. It's at 81%. That means less than 20% of studies have been done on non-Europeans. Of those, the majority of Asians, only about 4% on people of African or uh, Hispanic ancestry, Native American ancestry. We have to do something about that. And for that reason, my lab and our African collaborators have been doing field work in Africa, and I want to just show you a little bit of what that's like and some of the challenges. We could discuss that more afterwards. This is from Ethiopia in 2010. We had to bring all of our supplies with us. We are doing, this is an anthropometric setup. This is me returning results, which is something extremely important that many people don't do. These are our colleagues in Cameroon from the University of Yaoundé uh, that we're collaborating with and several people in my lab, including um, a postdoc from Cameroon, Eric Mabunwe. So in these regions, we're collecting DNA and RNA and frozen plasma from blood, and then we're getting detailed ethnographic information. And we have a challenge of how we're going to process those in areas with um, little or no electricity. So we actually have started setting up a, a generator that's out of the screen here and setting up our laboratory in the bush. And then we look at phenotypic diversity. So that includes very detailed anthropometric measurements, height, weight, percent body fat, and so on. We look at cardiovascular lung and blood phenotypes, metabolic function, and infectious disease status. Now, one of the challenges is, how do you distinguish genetic from environmental factors that are influencing variable traits, including disease risk? One of the approaches that we are taking is to compare people of similar genetic ancestry, but living in different environments. So, for example, an urban uh, versus rural environment. The other thing you could do is you could look at people of very different genetic ancestry, which is shown by these different colors here, that live in the same environment and have different risk for disease. So as an example, 
These are two groups in Cameroon uh, that live in a similar area. The Fulani are uh, traditionally nomadic pastoralists, and we're actively studying this population now in Cameroon. And one of the couple of unique things about that group, one is that they have a relative uh, resistance to malaria for reasons that we don't yet understand. When we were doing field work, the other thing that we noticed is that they have um, some of the highest prevalence of diabetes and hypertension that I've ever seen in rural populations in Africa. We hypothesized that might actually be tied into each other. A boosted immune response makes them resistant to malaria, but perhaps more susceptible to hypertension and diabetes. In southern Africa, the San, who until recently were traditional hunter-gatherers, now live nearby agriculturalists, and yet they have an increased risk for TB. So I want to tell you now about um, patterns of genetic variation on a global level. This is from a study we published several years ago, but it remains the largest study to date of genetic variation across uh, African populations. And the way to interpret this is that we use probabilistic approaches to infer genetically defined ancestral populations. And they're shown by these different colors. You can see that this is made up of lines, and each line represents a person, and they can have ancestry from these different ancestral population clusters. These are the non-Africans. We can see that they're generally clustering by geographic region. People who self-identify as European or Middle Eastern are shown here in blue. Here are people from India, from Pakistan, Central Asia, East Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. In Africa, you could just look at all the colors, and you could see that there's a lot of genetic diversity compared to on a global level. Now, if we just zoom in on Africa, and for ease of presentation, I just merge people into these pie charts by region, but all the colors are showing you there's a lot of variation, and there's no such thing as a representative African population. The Thousand Genomes Project that I told you about, they're mainly focused on these populations that are shown with orange ancestry. They're missing a lot of diversity. So what's the cause? What's, <laughs> what resulted in all this diversity of these patterns that we see? Part of it is demographic history, large population size, historic migration events, admixture, but also natural selection. And I love this quote. This is from Darwin from On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. And he said, this preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. So this is from a review paper that my lab published in Science last year, where we looked at examples of local adaptation, local genetic adaptation to different environments. And I'm going to step through and highlight a few of these. And the first one I'm going to mention is a genetic adaptation to lactose tolerance. So lactose tolerance, the ability to drink milk as an adult, is thought to be an adaptive trait. And it's most prevalent in populations that have a lot of dairying, drink a lot of milk. Very common in Northern Europe, very low prevalence in East Asia, low prevalence in Native Americans, low prevalence in most Africans except East Africans who have cattle. We did field work in Africa, in East Africa, amongst the pastoralists. We did a test of lactose tolerance. And we identified several novel genetic variants that were near the gene lactase that regulates lactose tolerance. These happen to be regulatory variants. And they arose independently from the variant influencing lactose tolerance in Europeans. They also happen to be very uh, geographically restricted in Africa. And we also saw a whopping signature of natural selection. So these in red, these are individuals who have two copies of the genetic variant associated with lactose tolerance. That variant was so increased the fitness of the people who had it such that they had more children and their children had more children and it swept to high frequency in the population. And when it did that, it dragged with it the neighboring variation. If you look at chromosomes that have the um, ancestral allele, you don't see that. That's a really whopping signature. Another example, a classic example, is uh, genetic variants that play a role in malaria resistance, and in particular, sickle cell disease. This is very common in people of African descent. It has been shown that this is due to a mutation in the uh, beta globin gene. People who have two copies of that mutated allele are likely going to die. This is fatal if not treated. But people who are heterozygote, meaning they have one normal copy and one disease copy, are actually protected against malaria. And that's really demonstrated here. When we look at the prevalence of Plasmodium falciparum, which is the parasite that causes the most severe type of malaria, 
we see it's really, that prevalence is really strongly correlated with the prevalence of the sickle allele. So here we have natural selection resulting in a high frequency of a variant that can cause disease. Now, this sickle cell has been under, underfunded, I would say, compared to diseases common in Europeans. However, there has been a success story. There was a genome-wide association study that was done and identified a gene, um, let's see, BCL11A, and this gene regulates the expression of, hem of uh, fetal hemoglobin. So people have naturally occurring variants that increase ex expression of fetal hemoglobin, and even if they had that sickle cell mutation, their phenotype's not as bad. So people are actually now developing genetic editing approaches. They may be able to cure this, but the problem is that's not going to do us any good in sub-Saharan Africa. We ultimately have to have an inexpensive therapeutic, and this is actually something that Gerd Blabel here at Penn is working on actively. The next example is a gene called APOL1 that's common in West Africa. And uh, genome-wide association studies found that this was associated with kidney disease in people of African descent. This plot is showing you that um, kidney disease is very common in African American populations relative to other populations. And this particular, these variants that they found, if you have two copies of these, you have up to a tenfold increased risk of getting kidney disease. That is a huge risk factor. And it turns out that these mutations play a role in resistance to the trypanosome parasite that causes sleeping sickness. Another example very similar to what we see at sickle, uh, with sickle cell anemia. The last examples I'm going to tell you about were two recent studies. One was done in the Inuit population in Greenland, and the other was done among Samoan uh, population, the Samoan population. And let me start with the Inuit study. So they found a very strong genomic signature of selection at some genes that co code for fatty acid desaturases uh, enzymes. These play an important role in metabolizing lipids, and they have a very high fat diet. They eat a lot of whale fat, for example. And it turns out they then used, looked uh, at a genome-wide association study and looked at how this variant was associated with different traits like height and BMI, and they found an association when they looked in European populations, they found that it was strongly uh, impacted height, yet they had never found this in European populations because it's so rare there. But in the Inuit, it's about 98% frequency. So that's how it can be informative to look at ethnically diverse populations. In the Samoan population, they have the highest incidence of obesity uh, in the world. And in the study, again, they found this gene that showed a signature of natural selection and was strongly associated with BMI. So it's a 1.5-fold increase. To give you an idea, people who have two copies of the variant associated with higher BMI are on average about 18 pounds heavier. So again, that's a major impact. So in conclusion, our evolutionary history has shaped the pattern of genetic variation that we see. The prevalence of non-communicable diseases differs in ethnically diverse populations. It is absolutely critical that genomic studies must include ethnically diverse populations. And we must distinguish both genetic and environmental factors that are influencing health disparities and they're interacting together. And ultimately, we want to develop better uh, personalized medicine approaches. And I will just end by thanking the many people who contributed and pass it over to Good afternoon. It's a great honor and pleasure to be able to participate with Karen and Sarah in this important discussion of health disparities. Uh, as you heard, I'm a law professor, sociologist, I'm also a professor in Africana Studies, and I'm going to address this question focusing primarily on racial health disparities from more of a legal, sociological, and especially political uh, point of view. Science operates in the context of politics, so that's the part that I want to talk about. Uh, in 2007 in Chicago, there was published a very striking study that found that 
black women in Chicago, although in Chicago they had a lower incidence of breast cancer than white women, died at twice the rate as white women. And in this Chicago Magazine article, they asked the question we've been asking, why and what, what must be done about it? And as we've heard, there's uh, many ways to think about why would it be that black women in Chicago die at twice the rate from breast cancer as white women. Uh, one might be it has to do with something in the environment. Another might be that there's something innately that pre predisposes black women to death from breast cancer. Uh, and one of the clues that these researchers looked at was how that gap developed over the 20 years prior to the study. So in 1980, black women and white women died from breast cancer at exactly the same rate. And the gap occurred over the next 20 years with not black women's death rate going up, it stayed the same. It was that white women's death rate was cut in half. And the researchers concluded that it had to be, or most likely had to be something to do with the advances in breast cancer detection and treatment over those 20 years. As Dr. Whitman, who was shown on the first slide, said to me when I interviewed him about it, white women got all the advantages of the advances in breast cancer research, and black women in Chicago got absolutely no advantage from it. Now, uh, despite findings like this, there is a persistent view that the reason why black people suffer from more from disease in the United States is because there's something innately in their bodies that predisposes them to disease and death from disease. And so I want to talk a little bit about the very concept of race and black race and where that comes from. We know that the idea that human beings are divided into races uh, originates around the 17th century and is really, really reinforced during the uh, 18th century enlightenment period with European typologists creating hierarchies of human beings after the point when Europeans began to conquer other peoples and enslave them. And so we can think of race as a way of classifying people in order to justify enslavement and conquest. Uh, I, we can also think of science as being highly influenced by the division of human beings into race. Uh, it has been a way that scientists since that, this time have classified human beings in order to study them. Many people thinking you have to classify human beings by race in order to study them, which shows how influential this approach to uh, science and humanity was. That idea transferred to the United States with naturalists in the United States like Thomas Jefferson continuing to believe that there were natural distinctions between blacks and whites and using those distinctions as a justification for the political inequality between blacks and whites. So Jefferson observed differences that he said came from nature and he explained the reason why black people could not participate equally in the United States with whites was because of those innate biological differences. That idea was absolutely essential to the justification for slavery in the United States, and it was promoted by doctors uh, and medical researchers like Samuel Cartwright, a very prominent uh, researcher who got his education at University of Pennsylvania Medical School and uh, uh, was commissioned in Louisiana to investigate the peculiar diseases of black people. Uh, the idea that people of different races have peculiar diseases and experience common diseases differently. His major theory was that black people had lower lung capacity than whites and had to be forced to work in order to be healthy. So according to his theory, black people were better off enslaved because that was the only way they could be healthy. He also discovered a disease he called drapetomania, which was the mental illness that black people who escaped plantations had because, of course, they must be crazy if to leave enslavement, which was actually good for them. 
Now, that idea that black people are categorically different than white people in terms of their experience of disease has continued in medical practice in the United States. And so doctors are taught to treat patients according to race, but not just to use race as part of their diagnosis. In some respects, race is embedded within technology so that automatically a black patient is seen as different from a white patient regardless of the symptoms uh, or other clinical indications. And one example is uh, this, the glomerular filtration rate. Uh, in this blood test, you can see that there is an automatic different reading for black, a black patient than a patient of any other race. In other words, this is reading a protein in the blood. I, won't, I don't have time to go into the details of it, but the same amount of protein in the blood is, produces a different reading if the patient is black than if the patient is white. The doctor is looking at this patient, and if the doctor believes the patient is black, it's one reading. If the doctor believes the patient is any other race, it produces a different reading. That is an automatic categorical distinction, which I understand is based on an old theory that black people have greater muscle mass as a race than white people, regardless of what the, the scrawny little pa black patient in front of the doctor. Okay. Um, that, Samuel uh, Cartwright's perfection of a spirometer to measure lung capacity in blacks compared to whites uh, has continued to the present day in the form of automatic correction of lung capacity for assuming racial differences in, in some versions of the spirometer. Uh, again, the same amount, the same reading is different for a black patient than a patient of other races based on the assumption that black people naturally have lower lung capacity. Now, most doctors will say, well, we use race as a proxy for other factors that are more important because it's, help, it's a helpful tool and this benefits uh, black patients. But there are lots of examples in, of how this mistreats black patients. And I'll just have time to point to one especially horrifying example, and that is the undertreatment of black patients for pain. Uh, numerous studies have found that black patients get less pain medication or no pain medication for the exact same injuries that white patients have, like a long bone fracture that you can see on an x-ray. Uh, a very disturbing study that came out a couple years ago was the difference in analgesic opioids given to children who are in severe pain from appendicitis. Uh, look at the difference. Now, and interestingly, this relates to another health disparity we're seeing today, which is the very high rate of opioid addiction among white people. We saw lots of statistics where blacks are faring worse in terms of opioid addiction and deaths from overdoses from heroin and opioids, white people, are their rates are skyrocketing. In fact, you may have heard that the white people are the only group in the United States whose death rate is increasing. Uh, and it's largely because of suicides and uh, opioid and heroin overdoses, you know, which we can trace in part to doctors not wanting to prescribe this kind of pain relief to black patients, but being perfectly fine prescribing it to their white patients. Uh, because of why? Uh, well, an interesting study last year from University of Virginia linked this undertreatment uh, of black patients for pain to stereotypes about biological differences between whites and blacks, uh, including beliefs like black people have thicker skin than white people, black people's nerve endings are less sensitive than white people's. This is what residents who are treating patients uh, at University of Virginia uh, found, but there's evidence that this is widespread among uh, doctors in the United States. Now, uh, when the map of the human genome was unveiled in 2000, there was a lot of expectation that research would be done without grouping people by race because everyone involved announced that the human 
genome showed no evidence of racial divisions uh, at the genetic level. Clinton saying that human beings, regardless of race, were than 99.9 percent .9 the same. We heard from Sarah, just if you take the continent of Africa, the amount of genetic diversity that exists in what is supposed to be a separate race of people, but also that the diversity around the world cannot be grouped into what we think of as races. But what happened instead, as Nicholas Wade announced in the New York Times, was that scientists began to look for genetic differences between human races and to explain health disparities based on genetic differences in race. Uh, I published a book in 2011 called Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the first 21st Century, where I documented this increase in interest in uh, gene-based uh, variation between races. And I argued that uh, there was a new biopolitics to this that very much mirrored the old biopolitics of race and science, which was that scientists were defining race as a genetic grouping, using genetic explanations for racial inequalities in a supposedly post-racial society. So genetic difference comes in handy when you're in a society where you can see lots of racial inequality, but we're not supposed to have racial inequality anymore in the United States. What causes it then? Innate differences, uh, many would say, between the races. And then biotech and pharmaceutical companies are producing race-specific biological remedies for these inequalities. Uh, now, uh, Nicholas Wade wrote a book where he argues that there are three principal races, blacks, whites, and Asians, and that they evolved separately, and not only to have physical differences, but also differences in social values and social institutions. Uh, I, I won't uh, belabor that, but I want to point out that he provided a genetic definition of race based on this theory of separate evolution of black people, white people, and Asian people. I'm not sure exactly when that happened or what prevented people on the vast continent of Europe and Asia, you know, it's one landmass, from uh, interacting, or where the line separated the two, the wall that existed that didn't allow uh, any interaction. But uh, he doesn't explain that, but that's the theory. Now, that theory shows up in a lot of scientific journals as well, that races are population clusters based on genetic differences due to evolutionary pressure. And another study uh, in 2013 found that after the mapping of the human genome, there was a huge increase in studies that treat race as a biological category. Uh, these are studies that uh, address the relationship between race and genomics in peer-reviewed scientific journals. There was also been a continuance of, this has happened for, for centuries, but a continuance of the idea that health disparities like the disparity in infant mortality, preterm births, breast cancer, et cetera, are caused by some innate factor that predisposes black people to these negative consequences. And this is just one example of a hypothesis that black race, independent of other factors, increases the risk of extreme preterm births and its frequency of recurrence, uh, hypothesizing that it would be possible to control for all the other factors that could possibly explain why black women have a higher incidence of preterm birth. And so what the researchers do is control for a few factors and then conclude that uh, there is a probable genetic, con con well, they say it in very vague terms, but uh, they conclude basically that genes are the explanation for these disparities in preterm birth. And the New York Times reports it as if they found this, when in fact they did not find it because they did not control for the other possible reasons why there are these disparities. 
Uh, these kinds of studies have a lot of confusion to them, which I think it's important for institutions like the National Institutes of Health to uh, clear up. One is the confusion between a genetic and sociopolitical category. When these studies use African Americans, what are, what are they talking about? Are they talking about people with pure African ancestry? How much African ancestry? Is somebody who has mostly European ancestry but one drop of African ancestry a, a, a part of the black race? Why are they the black race? Well, clearly because of a socio-political decision that they're part of the black race. Uh, criteria, how do you know who belongs to each race? Some use self-identified race, some use the OMB directive that Karen referred to, which is the census category. It's a social category, but they use it as if it's a biological category. Some are making up biological uh, ancestry informative marker uh, basis for a racial category. Some use things like Spanish last name as a indicator of a biological category. And others use the appearance. They just look at the person and guess what race they are, or they use stereotypes about them. It also, as I mentioned with the uh, other study, confuses genetics with unmeasured factors. You can't conclude that genes are any amount of contribution you don't know if you have in control for the other factors and often researchers leave out very important factors including the experience of discrimination as a op-ed piece uh, said a couple of weeks ago in the new york times we're sick of racism literally and this is a new field of research that hasn't been uh, adequately brought into studies that are concluding uh, that there are genetic reasons for health inequities. Uh, recently, this idea that the reason for differences in disease burden among African Americans is because of genes has been adopted by the Food and Drug Administration in its approval of the first race-specific drug, which, by the way, was not developed using any genetic research or any reference to race. Uh, for commercial reasons, it ended up being a drug for black people. And the FDA uh, assumed that race could be used as a surrogate for genetic markers. Uh, now, that, what I've been talking about, has also faced opposition or contestation for 100 years by researchers like W.B. Du Bois, who synthesized a sociological and an epidemiological approach. And he pointed out that many of the diseases like consumption, tuberculosis, that were attributed as innately uh, part of black people's biology were experienced by other groups like the Irish. Uh, and he says, but when they were not popular. You know, at the time when the Irish were considered inferior to uh, the British, the, the English, uh, they also suffered from these diseases. So he recognizes that there, there are political and social reasons for these gaps. Uh, in my book, Fatal Invention, I argue that we should be studying how racism is embodied and make the distinction between race as a biological category that naturally produces these uh, disparities as opposed to a political category that has biological consequences. And here at Penn, I founded a program on race, science, and society where we are looking at transformative and interdisciplinary approaches to the role of race in scientific research uh, that aims at promoting social justice and dispelling the myth that race is a natural division of human beings. And in conclusion, uh, I, I argue that we should be addressing the social and political uh, institutional reasons for health inequities that are supported by a biological theory of race, not incorporating a biological theory of race to explain what are social differences. Uh, and in the end, a more just society, if we want to and health disparities based on race in the United States, the best way, and there's lots of evidence for that, to do that would to, be ha to have a more just society, a more racially equal society. That would produce a healthier one for everybody in this country. Thank you.
Thank you. So now we have time for some uh, questions, comments, discussion. Um, we have some handheld mics that um, Brianne and Sarah uh, have available. Um, and uh, would ask that if you have a comment or a question that you identify yourself and your primary affiliation uh, so we can know where you're coming from, more or less. So let's start right here. Okay. Hi, uh, that was a terrific presentation. Uh, my name is Jerome Taylor. I'm a child psychiatrist, uh, do schizophrenia research, and interested in how genes impact uh, intervention of efficacy. Um, and one, I think it's really important, I'm really happy you guys did this presentation because I think in America we're very uncomfortable talking about race. So the fact that we're even talking about race period is important. Um, and I think that um, all three presentations were beautifully done. And I want to say, Dr. Roberts, I actually used your, hopefully I didn't misinterpret your study, but like the idea that um, race is a social construct um, I recently quoted it in a paper yeah. when a reviewer kind of commented um, based, on, based on kind of wanted to understand what race actually meant um, and kind of questioned some of the methods. And I was like, you know, race is a social construct based on biological characteristics like skin color, hair texture, you know, nose, or, you know, um, facial features. Um, and I think that... Um, it's important that all three of you are talking because I think g genes are important um, to understand some diseases like sickle cell anemia. Um, and uh, I guess the question is, how do you see us going forward in using genes to better understand disease? I, I completely agree with your with the premises that Dr. Glanz um, and um, Dr. Roberts noted in that, like I. If you really you want to start at the bottom of the pyramid, right? You want to address social inequities. You want to address policy. Like those are going to make huge um, changes. But I guess, like, uh, I, but I also think it's really important in terms of understanding mechanism of disease to understand how genetics works. And I think um, the the lack of GWAS studies, like you talked about in um, African Americans, is like. It's, it was astounding to me. Literally, I just I recently found this out and was very disturbed. But um, the, so I guess how can we merge those kind of your three perspectives to create change? And then the, the second um, uh, comment is, or question is really, what do you think about, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to save that one because... <laughs> need to be done, and uh, one of which is first, more inclusion, okay? So that was a shocking statistic. Can you speak louder? Is the, um, is the mic not on? I wonder if we have to push something. Maybe just closer to the mic? Uh, it's not on. Hello? Is that on? When you tap it, I hear it. Yeah. I will just pull this closer. How about that? Is that better? No. No? Okay, whoever's going to control the mic. Mike's in control. Hello? Hello? Yeah, no, no, no. He said he was going to turn it on. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. You might have to be for my panel with the question microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How many pick professors is it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll, just, we'll share this. Um, okay. So there are a number of things I think that need to be done. And uh, one of the first is simply to include more diverse, more diversity in uh, genomic research. Now this is important for a number of reasons. One of which is that um, some of the studies, for example, there's been moderate success in identifying genetic variants that play a role in complex traits like diabetes and hypertension. We still have a long ways to go. So, but the ones that they have found, when they try to replicate across ethnic groups, so they take those variants, say, that are associated, say, with risk for diabetes, or say hypertension, and then you look at a different population other than the one in which it was identified, it doesn't always show that association. Now, there could be two reasons for that, probably more than two, <laughs> but one could be that there could be different genetic variants 
that are uh, associated with that disease in different ethnic groups. The second could be that these methods rely on um, looking for associations between a genetic marker and a disease-causing gene or variant, and that differs in different ethnic groups. So it may not tag as well, essentially. <coughs> so that's one of the other reasons it's important to look in different ethnic groups. Now, there can be cases where the genes are exactly the same in the different ethnic groups, and in fact, it can be really informative for genes that are important to play a role in disease in all populations to look across ethnic groups because of lower levels of linkage disequilibrium in, say, uh, African populations, you can find map. You can basically get closer to what that actual causal variant is. The other thing I wanted to mention is that because of this lack of inclusion of ethnically diverse populations, and particularly in Africa, it has led to misdiagnosis and um, or missing uh, diagnoses in the case of rare diseases where at this point now we can do whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing, sequencing all the coding regions of the genes. There have been cases where they have missed, uh, either missed the imported variant in people of African descent because it hasn't been characterized in those populations. So they don't even know what the causal variants are. And the opposite, in people say of European ancestry, they have falsely said that somebody has a disease-causing mutation, which they don't, because if you had just looked in African populations, you would have seen that it's actually really common there. And so those, there's a number of reasons that we need to increase representation. And I will let someone else have a say. So I want to kind of tack on to that um, some thoughts about how we might get there. I think Sarah's you know, nailed things that are out um, of my expertise specifically, but I think there are two things. So one is the science policy related to race and ethnicity um, that I just briefly pointed out at the end with the requirements that we report on race and ethnicity. I mean, even the, the use of the first question being ethnicity, Hispanic slash Latino or not, um, is really a political characterization. I mean, and, and, you know, Dorothy mentioned like a Spanish surname. Like, so that means like that somebody from uh, upper crust Castilian from, from Spain, you know, gets, gets that check. What we find when we do studies and when we hear from participants, they don't think of themselves as Latino, non-Latino first. Um, I, I had a project coordinator once who said, I am definitely a white Latino, blue eyes. You know, she was from Mexico. But, but most people don't even think of themselves that way. Secondly, I think that we use those characterizations that are required part of conducting federally funded research um, as a checkbox. I think it's kind of, it's like it's been done, it's there, you know, you have to fill those, that paperwork out to get your grant reviewed favorably, and then you have to fill it out in your progress report. It's not really given that meaning. The second thing that I want to bring up, and this might, might fall better in Dorothy's uh, zone is the question of trust in, um, of research. And, um, you know, we, ha we didn't talk about it in our presentation today, but there is a long history of mistrust of disadvantaged and minority, and particularly African Americans, um, but, you know, I mean, it extends to like Jews during the Holocaust, um, uh, you know, of people being used for research. And um, we, we need to deal with that. I mean, it's only recently that an official apology was. Um, you know, made for, you know, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, but, um, but we need to deal with it in how we interact with people, not just, you know, as a society. There, it's it's going to take a long time to overcome some of the past wrongs, but I think in the way that we work with people, we probably have an opportunity to make a difference that way. And let's see if Dorothy wants yeah, to add I'll to that. Sure. So I, I think to begin with, in answer to your question, I think it's important to be clear what is the question we're trying to answer with race. So I am not saying that genes aren't important to health or that we shouldn't do genetic research. I'm saying that genes are not the best explanation for why we have huge gaps in health outcomes for common diseases among racial groups in the United States. The most plausible explanation for why black people die from heart failure at younger ages at such higher rates than white people, or 
uh, have such higher rates of HIV infection is not that black people, however you want to define that group, it are predisposed to death, you know, to, to infection and death. It's because of the social factors that make them more vulnerable to these diseases and to dying from them, both in terms of living conditions, but also in terms of access to health care. And, and living conditions broadly, the, the stress from experiencing racism. The, you know, I think it's incredible that we would start looking for a genetic explanation for gaps in health, uh, you know, higher rates of heart failure among young African American men, and not take into account their far, far higher risk of getting arrested and put in jail. That would be the first thing I think of, right? That, that's plausible. So that doesn't mean that it wouldn't be helpful to look at gene therapies or to understand better how diseases operate in human bodies by looking at, at genes or to have very diverse groups in, in, you know, involved as research subjects in research because it's helpful to have diversity when you're exploring genes, but that's very different from explaining very large gaps in health outcomes based on innate differences as opposed to the social differences. We, we've known for so long that you can track the health outcomes for people in a society based on how much their income. We know that people with low income are going to have worse, worse health outcomes than people with high income. It, when we talk about the deaths now of white people from opioid addiction, no one is saying white people are predisposed to opioid addiction. They're looking at all the social political factors that led to this epidemic. But when it's black people who have high rates of anything, it's, it must be in their genes, it must, they're naturally predisposed to it. We have a very different approach when white people have higher rates of social illness that's associated with social inequality. So that's the, the first distinction. I think it's important for researchers to ask more clearly, why are we using it? That would, NIH could help uh, scientific journal editors could help by just requiring that researchers explain what they mean by race, how they identify who belongs to the racial categories they're using, and why they're using race in their research. It's used in such a sloppy manner now. It's incredible, incredible. So that would, that would help, just to force researchers to, to think about why they're using Which race. Which a lot of journals do. They say that you have to say race, you have to explain why. But they, I think the piece that's missing is really, like, why are you looking at race? So are you looking at race because you think there are innate differences, or yeah. are you looking at race because you think they're exposed to more stress? Exactly, race? exactly. And I think those are really complex. Exactly. Problems. So that's, that's just a, a starting point, yeah. <laughs> a very basic starting point. And then the kind of interdisciplinary work that we're doing where sociologists, epidemiologists, geneticists, anthropologists, you know, et cetera, are working together to figure out what these relationships are. Hi, um, my name is Irene Hedden. I'm a social epidemiologist and postdoctoral fellow at Drexel University in the Urban Health Collaborative. Um, my question is uh, kind of following up on this idea of including more diversity in genetic and also research kind of being an epidemiologist, just like the knowledge production of disease patterns in populations. Um, how do we, I mean, we want to increase diversity, but there is, as you mentioned, Dr. Glenn's, um, this historical kind of mistrust and trauma, especially in the US, but even across different um, cultures, there's a different understanding of what genes and blood and these kind of biological constituencies mean. So how do we increase diversity, respect trust of communities, and um, kind of 
do this in a way that's ethical for all populations involved. So I, I kind of want this from a perspective of like practical experiences on your end and practices and toolboxes that we can use in engaging with our research in different kind of collaborations. I, I think Sarah would be a great person to answer that from her well, experiences. And, and you, but and I have one quick, yeah. <laughs> one quick suggestion, which is increase the diversity of the researchers. I, that's, I can't say enough how important that is, and we just don't have enough. And, you know, I think people, there needs to be a more diverse uh, community of scientists who are doing work in these communities. I think it's going to help build trust, for example. And I think education is really important. And um, I don't know if you have any other comments based on the type of work you've been doing. Uh, well, I think, I think the comments that I have, I totally agree with, her, with what you're saying, um, would be similar to some of the pictures that, that Sarah showed in, of going out in Africa, is really working with populations. And um, I think our scientific tradition and our scientific funding mechanisms could be better um, organized to facilitate that. Um, I, I'm, I fear, having done a lot of work in community-engaged research over the years, that it's becoming a checkbox the way that the race and ethnicity inclusion box are. And I think that we really need some leadership to step back and think about how this can be done in, in a meaningful way and, um, and maybe in a coordinated way, because I think there are certainly efforts to diversify the health and science workforce, there are programs, et cetera. I, I think there, that it could be done better um, and not just as a you know, as a pro forma kind of a thing to, to have out here. I think it's also important to recognize that the reason for mistrust is because the researchers were exploiting <laughs> and experimenting on and harming communities. You know, that it's not as if black people, I'm most familiar with uh, African Americans in, in this arena, it's not because they have a fear of science or backward view of medical research. It's because they have an experience of actually being experimented on and harmed. So and institutionally, like it's not just yes. science. I think it's right. institutions in general. Well, that's true too. Okay, that's true too. Of which science and medicine is part of that. So there, that ha it's it. it that has to change. They have to see evidence of change. And part of it is what Dr. Glass is saying is actually engaging with communities and showing a benefit to the communities that you're not just using them, you're benefiting them. And that may mean new ideas about how to benefit a community. You know, that, that you're actually going to help to build a new hospital in the community or help to build a new school in the community or other ways that people could be benefited from it. You know, African Americans have embraced genetic testing to determine uh, their ancestry into different tribes in Africa. I won't comment on <laughs> that, but it's not as if African Americans have an aversion to genetic testing. They, are, they use it at extremely high rates compared to other groups. Partly because Henry Louis Gates is promoting it, and Rick Kittles is the uh, a black geneticist, the founder of the first uh, genetic testing service. But they have used it in remarkable ways, and it's extremely <coughs> popular. So it's not because of some, again, cultural or innate aversion to it. It's a reaction, a response to a history that's very real. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Fioliso, and I am currently a research technician in genetics over at CHOP. Uh, and I have a question for Dr. Tishkoff. When you're out conducting your research, and uh, when you are explaining your work to the people that you are eventually conducting this research on, what are your strategies given that? your scientific and medical vocabulary may be very different from those that you're working with? So that's a great question. We have to explain things in a way that uh, people can understand. I'll just give 
one example, well, a couple. One is that if you talk about um, family relate relatedness, for example, I think that's something everybody can relate to. So you look more like your sisters and brothers than someone outside of the family and, and so on. And people understand that also in Africa, there's already a sense of um, your ancestors being in your blood. <laughs> so they didn't find that concept to be uh, too surprising. And as Dorothy was saying, People are really intelligent, <laughs> and so they get it if you understand it, uh, if you explain it carefully. And so, for example, one of the groups we studied called the Sandawe, who were traditionally hunters and gatherers. They live in a pretty remote area of Tanzania, and I go back and do follow-ups and, and uh, check back with people. One of them gave me um, a pamphlet. What is it like? What the missionaries give out <laughs> like the Watchtower or something, <laughs> but it wasn't about evolution, obviously. But it actually had a double helix, and he pointed at that and he said, "That's what you're studying, right?" And you could trace how and I don't remember how he said it. Black people in America came from Africa. He totally got it. He probably had an eighth grade education or less. So I think people do get it if you explain carefully. And I think there was another question back here. Hi, um, my name is Amaka. I'm a research coordinator for the Academic Practice Partnership for Underserved Communities in Philadelphia grant with the Penn Nursing School. So my question was actually very similar to hers um, for Dr. Tishkoff. Um, with all the different rural communities that you worked with, how did you go about, I'm curious to know how you went about getting informed consent from the participants and the uh, residents of those communities, and if you had any experiences where you got pushback from those communities? How did you deal with that? Yeah, so we've been, we were really careful to approach this in an ethical manner right from the start. And we started this 17 years ago. And at that time, it was not uncommon that geneticists were kind of flying in, <laughs> helicopter genetics, they called it, taking blood and leaving. And there was not even informed consent. So we actually took the approach that we have to do this the right way from the beginning. That takes a long time. <laughs> so the number one thing is you have to go through ethical review in the, each country that you work at. That usually lasts, I would say the shortest time is a year and the longest it's taken me is up to nine years. So it takes a very long time. And it has to be culturally sensitive. And it's going to change depending on what country or region that you're working in. You have to have local collaborators who are active collaborators from the country in which you're working. We involve the community members as much as we can actually in the research process, collecting data, for example. We spend a lot of time going to communities. It could take very long weeks, for example, or more, doing community discussions, question and answer periods and things like that until we finally come back and then each person has to give consent. We don't um, pay money for samples. That could be considered coercive uh, in an African environment. But um, we try to do some community service if we can. It depends on the particular population. Um, one of the groups that actually I really liked how this worked out was the Fulani that I mentioned earlier. Um, they have a more organized structure. There's like a, a community organization trying to benefit the local people. And um, they asked that instead of getting them a small gift, we, we often will give a small thank you gift, but nothing coercive. And they said, put the equivalent amount of money into a community, um, I don't know, um, fund. Mm -hmm. And they were going to use it to do work on the local school. And they actually did. By the time you know we left camera, they were actually doing that work. And it would be great if we could do that more often, but it's very dependent on the culture and the people. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we can adjourn to our reception. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, the growing multiracial population has had a in any of your research, either categorizing people or confounding population-based genetics at all? Uh, I, I can answer that. <laughs> I can answer that just briefly. Um, I spent 11 years um, living in Hawaii at the University of Hawaii. And uh, one of the most interesting things about Hawaii is that whites are a minority. Um, and the uh, variation of, in uh, racial ethnic groups, and a lot of them Asian Pacific Islander, um, uh, it is a really interesting uh, issue to study. And my, some of my colleagues have been doing a lot of research on that around heart disease and cancer susceptibility and, and so forth. And uh, some of my research was with kids um, in tobacco use prevention um, and you know, healthy lifestyles. And 
we always ask people what their race was, but the rate of intermarriage was so high in Hawaii that I have to say that we said, like, better do this research really quick because in the next generation, you're not going to be able to distinguish who's, you know, Japanese American, Chinese American, Filipino, and, and onward. Um, so that's a, that's a microcosm where um, the mixed race phenomenon is accelerating even faster than the United States as a whole, but it's, it's really um, an interesting and, and it continues to challenge us as, you know, the time goes on. I would just say that I think that the fact that people of different races can have children together is one of the problems for the belief that human beings are naturally divided into races. Because even though it may be increasing, it's always been the case, always, that people from different populations have children with each other. And then what do you call those children? That was a problem in the United States in the 1600s, when the very first law passed in the United States in Virginia in 1622 had to grapple with the question, what race are the children born to black women fathered by, they said, then Englishmen? I mean, from the 1600s, white men were sexually assaulting enslaved African women and producing mixed race children. Thomas Jefferson, who I show, had a whole parcel of mixed race children. So this is not, this isn't new. It's something that has vexed the question of race from the beginning. And in the United States, the, the, the answer was, well, it will promote slavery better if we say those children are black and can be enslaved. And so now in the United States, we think of Barack Obama, for example, as a black man with a white mother rather than a white man with a black father. That, that idea that he's a white would shut, you know, that people just couldn't wrap their minds around it. But of course, he's just as white as he is black. It's just a social definition. And so, yes, researchers have to deal with it. So they, they talk about admixture. But at when does admixture begin? Which generation? Is it only if one parent is identified as one race and the other identified as another race? What if you have grandparents of different races or great-great-grandparents or great-great-great? How far back do we go before we call this person mixed race? All of these questions are legal and political questions. They're not you know, so-called scientific questions. And so for me, the fact that you cannot answer that with genes alone, you, you can't possibly, that, it, that means that it's not a genetic category. It has to be a social and political category. The, the very possibility of hybridity in human beings is a problem for the notion that human beings are divided into distinguishable biological races. Add one thing. Sure. It's a human characteristic. Oh, they like to intermix. This happens in Africa. If you remember those circles I showed and all the different colors, it's the norm is admixture. There are no, there's very few pure, you know, populations. I don't care how remote they are. There's been lots of intermixing, and to take it to an even further extreme, we've even intermixed with other species. <laughs> <laughs> so when modern humans. Left, Af left Africa, they ran into Neanderthals and other archaic populations and interbred with them. And we see remnants of their genome now outside of Africa. And some people have shown that that's actually potentially impacting disease risk. Some of those variants are playing a role in disease risk. So there you go. <laughs> so um, we have a very nice reception. If you go out and turn to the left and continue the conversation or just enjoy the reception. Thank you all for coming.